everyone? It is the new room. All right, we should have a few extra chairs back there, so we should be good if any stragglers come in. Stan, would you like to lead us in prayer? I would and do that, and not even do the pledge. All right. <laughs> Great architect of the universe, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for the excellent location and place that we live and the good food. I just had lunch and it was excellent. We ask that you give your blessings to the Peroni family this week. We all mourn the loss of Tony. We ask your guidance of staff on board uh, and all that we do and know that we try and keep your, your words in our minds. In God's name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Oh, you want to play ball? Okay. So, this is probably one of my favorite <laughs> coffee connections today. I got five different speakers, so my voice gets saved a little bit, and complaints, you don't have a lot of time for them at the end. So. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so first, uh, we have a guest speaker, uh, Mrs. Jeannie Chu. Uh, she's going to talk to us today about advanced directives and advanced care planning and things like that. Why are we gonna talk about that? Well, because if you don't know what I do for a living, I run a retirement community, and I have people who flow through what we call a continuum of care. And inevitably, I get a lot of residents who end up in my skilled nursing center or even my assisted living ill-prepared for illness, ill-prepared for changes, and then it makes it difficult to execute certain things or even help uh, provide care in the ways needed. So educating ahead of time is always the best uh, solution. You know, be proactive about it, understand it, understand how to accomplish it, and then get it done. So it's always good to know, but it's always even better to get it done. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jeannie first. Welcome, Jeannie. Okay, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. There you are. There you go. All right, so I am a local attorney in town. I do do probate. Uh, prior to going to law school, I was a registered nurse for 15 years. So I do have a little bit of a medical knowledge to help out with these things that you need to be doing. So what I'm here to tell you about is actually ways to avoid probate for your heirs. Um, which I think is part of my job as an attorney is to try and help you from um, having your family members come see me later and give me your money, which I know that's not what you want to do. So anyhow, one of the things I try and explain to everybody is one of the ways you can avoid probate for your heirs is a simple thing that you would do at the bank. Um, you would go to the bank and you would make every single account you have there and this means every one of them your cds your savings your uh, iras your checking every single one of those accounts would have to be what's called payable on death um, so the uh, bank would designate each of those accounts as pod you would go in there you would designate who you would like uh, those accounts to go to upon your passing and your heirs, your beneficiaries, would simply show up at the bank, produce your death certificate, and the bank should cut them a check right there on the spot, and then they never have to go uh, see an attorney, open up a probate estate, get appointed as an uh, executor. None of that has to happen. The next thing I would encourage you to do is if any of you still own real estate or property, there's a simple form you can do um, that's called transfer on death deed. You would uh, you know, have to hire an attorney that would fill out a form, uh, a transfer form, where again you would designate who you would want your property to go to. So if you have four children, you would designate your property to go to those four children. You would sign a deed, we would record it, 
and then again upon your passing those <coughs> children would simply go to the recorder's office produce a death certificate and that property would be transferred <coughs> into their names and then they would be free to sell that property again never have to see an attorney for that you don't have to pay an attorney the next thing that is very important I try to explain to people there are four documents that you need to have three of those deal with prior to your death and the only one is after death so one of the things you need to have is a power of attorney for medical decisions so this one deals with um, a lot of people are very confused about this um, right now you're in you're in excellent health but if you were to need to go to surgery and then you would have rehab and you wouldn't be able to say you're being medicated um, you are no longer capable of making your own medical decisions the hospital or even uh, sometimes the nursing home would require there to be a designated medical decision maker for you this does not mean that you are completely giving up <coughs> your um, your ability to make your own decisions. It just means that in the interim period of time, um, you are not able to make your own decisions. So that is called a um, power of attorney for health decisions. And also in this form, there is an area where we always designate if indeed something does happen to you and you would have to have a guardian appointed. The guardian is court appointed guardian. Um, you can state in that form that if that happens, this is the person I would want to be appointed. Because a lot of times if you don't designate who you want to be that court appointed guardian for you, then the court will make that decision. I'm guardian for approximately 50 some people here in Clark County um, because of that very reason. Um, the next thing is also basically the same thing, but it deals with your finances. It's called a durable power of attorney for uh, finances. And so this is also the same exact situation. You're uh, possibly temporarily incapacitated in some form that you're unable to manage your own finances. And so in that period of time, you would need to have somebody that can go to the bank and um, talk to them about um, making um, payments out of your account for any of the bills that you have. The bank would have to see the original document. Um, a lot of times people lose this document. Um, we as attorneys, we do not hang on to that original document. I make a copy and keep it at my office. But I always return the original back to the person, and that is because uh, the Supreme Court has said that we as attorneys should not be hanging on to those uh, documents. So if you get an original healthcare power of attorney, a financial power of attorney, you need to find a place to put that original somewhere that your family can find it. Um, because what happens is you may have it for five years, maybe um, something happens to you that you can no longer remember where you put that form. And then your family is going through all of your stuff trying to find that form. And then it becomes a real big issue because the bank will not accept a copy. So it's very important, especially for the financial power of attorney, to hang on to that original and uh, tell somebody where you put it. The next thing is a living will. So many people are confused about what is a living will. A living will deals with nothing more than <coughs> end of life decisions. So it's, it's not a testamentary will that deals with after death. This is the living will that actually tells the nursing home paramedics, the hospital, that exactly what you want. Do you want to be resuscitated? Do you want to have life-saving medicine? Do you want to be put on a ventilator? Do you want to have um, life-saving uh, nutrition or fluids? Any of that. This form deals with only that. Um, so that is, that is a very important form that you have. 
and your family members or the nursing home would definitely need to have a copy of that. And just recently, I have been dealing with the hospitals calling me um, with the nursing home sending the do, do not resuscitate form. And then the doctor calling me saying, um, does your do not resuscitate form include um, intubation? And I just look at them like, well, obviously, nobody wants to be put on the ventilator, correct? I mean, that's why you're filling out the do not resuscitate form. Um, so I have to explain to them, no, you have clearly stated you do not want to be put on the ventilator. And just recently, just this past week, I had this very exact situation. And the doctor was calling me saying, uh, okay, I just want to know, do you want um, so-and-so to be put on the ventilator? And I said, well, his family has clearly told me they do not want him to be um, resuscitated, and that includes the ventilator. And then I said to him, can you tell me what is this gentleman's state of consciousness? And he goes, oh, he's, he's awake, he's alert. And I said, <laughs> okay, why are you asking me this? And they're like, well, I mean, we don't know. He may need one. And I, <laughs> and I said, okay, well, I just want you to know, um, I absolutely refuse. Do not put him on a ventilator. Um, you know, uh, that, that's, that's the end of that question. And a couple of days later, they called me from the hospital saying he is being discharged back to the nursing home. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's very, it's very important that you understand that sometimes um, the hospitals want to jump the gun. And, um, and it's, it's the job of whoever you designate as your decision maker um, to advocate on your best half and then to absolutely understand what all of these forms mean and why you're asking it and exactly what your role is when it comes to speaking to the doctors and the nurses at the hospital. Because um, if you don't understand that, um, then everybody would be put on a ventilator. And if you get put on a ventilator, sometimes it requires a court order uh, to get taken off of that ventilator um, if a family member doesn't agree. And I've actually been in that situation. Um, and just so you know, the state of Ohio requires you to have been on that ventilator for a minimum of 12 months oh. before you can be taken off with a court hearing. So that is a very important form. The can I interrupt for one? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I'm only interrupting because she, she made some very good points about the living will, but there is one other thing I want to make sure you understand. It's important that you understand that form and what you're selecting. Please go over your wishes and that form with a family member. I've recently had a situation where somebody became incapacitated and the family looked at that form and sometimes they're not written easily. You know, like it was one part where it said that they didn't want any, uh, any mechanical life-saving um, any mechanical life-saving measures, but then they said they would take a feeding tube, which would be a mechanical life-saving measure. So it was kind of contradictory, but the family had no idea what their loved one's wishes were. They were just depending on that form, but they had never gone over that form. So they didn't really know what the, what the relative's wishes were. And by that point, they were already on a feeding tube and already going down another path. And the family had actually made decisions contrary to what was in the living will. So make sure you explain it to a family member as well, because they are written in legal terms. And you may have gotten the explanation when you went over it, but if you don't explain your wishes to a family member, it, it, it might not go <coughs> as you had planned. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, that, that, that is an excellent point, and I actually have that same situation going on um, with somebody I'm guarding for over at Southbrook. Uh, the, the, one of the family members absolutely wants the feeding tube removed. Um, that feeding tube was put in several years ago when her mother had a stroke. Um, that decision was made by another family member, and so she just constantly tells me I want that removed. And I tell her, I'm sorry, but that, you can't remove that. I mean, once you place that in there, you cannot remove that. So um, that, and he is correct. You have to talk to your family members. You have to talk to your decision maker because you will be confronted 
by the doctor and they will start asking you those very questions um, about do you want life-saving treatment and just saying do not resuscitate requires you to be able to respond to them exactly what you mean by do not resuscitate it is far more than just I don't want CPR so the very next thing so those three things we just talked about deal with while you're still living um, the very last thing is the testamentary will that has to deal with what you want to happen to all of your property and who you want it to go to after your death. Um, a lot of people are confused by the living will and the testamentary will. So that's why we always say living will is while you're still living. Testamentary will is after death. A lot of people have that last will and testament but very few people have those other three documents which are very important to have. So are there any questions? Yes. How long are those good for? <coughs> we did ours 20 years ago. Are they still okay? As far as I know, they're still okay. I have people bring me those documents and I look them over. So as long as the people you designated as your um, agent on there are still living, they're good. Um, I also tell everybody, please have an alternate agent. Because if you don't, and you only listed one person, and that one person has passed away, you are now required to come see me and pay me to do a new one. So, And I don't think you want to do that. So please tell everybody to put an alternate agent on there. Yes. Uh, I just have a question going back to the resuscitation. Say you have surgery and they put you on, you know, you're having trouble breathing while you're in surgery. They put a thing on you and they take you to your room. Is that the same thing as the thing with I don't want life support system? Once I get the room, once I get on the respirator and they see that I'm not going to, you know, that that's going to keep me alive a bit, that be the same thing as not wanting a living? No, that is not the same thing. Um, being put on the respirator, uh, respirator requires you to be intubated with a tube down your throat. I believe what you're talking about is the BiPAP, um, which is uh, a mask that is put on there to force air into your lungs. Um, that is exactly what this other gentleman had at the hospital. That is not the same. In order to be put on the ventilator, they um, have to put, make you somewhat um, semi-unconscious because otherwise you're going to fight that. So once you become unconscious, you are no longer in control of making any of your own decisions. So if you're on the bypass, um, they do not medicate you to the point, unless you're really fighting it, um, that you can't still make decisions. So the being put on that bypass, the forced um, air into your lungs is not a, a ventilator. On the uh, TOD form, can that be applied to more than just real property? I'm thinking in terms of like stocks, bonds, bank accounts, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. No, um, the TOD um, transfer on death deed only applies to real estate. Um, what you're talking about is so each one of those things, if you have an annuity, um, you have a life insurance policy, every single one of those things, you should contact that company and designate a beneficiary. If you have a designated beneficiary, that does not go through probate. And there is also, uh, recently you can also do that for your vehicle. Um, it is exactly like a transfer on death deed, but for your vehicle. It has to be done at the um, Bureau of Motor Vehicles, but you can go down there, you can fill out a form, they'll keep it on file that says, upon my passing, I want my vehicle to go to this person. And again, no probate. Yes. Is there a handout going over everything you've told us today? I think it would be very helpful. Yes, there is. Where do we get it? Uh, it's up front. I made 10 copies, but Emily has assured me they can make many more. Yes. I don't know about Ohio, but is there a um, look back a number of years, anticipation of deaths? 
for signing this stuff over. I know it's in other states. In other words, you have to sign it over now because in, if you die in five years, that's okay. But if you sign over now and you die next year, they consider it anticipation of death and it's disallowed. That's the way it is in Maryland. I don't know about Ohio. Okay, so I believe what you're discussing is Medicaid. Um, so Medicaid does have a five-year look back. As far as all of these um, uh, forms for POAs, no, you can um, okay. you can sign those forms now. So I don't um, have that. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Anything? Anything else? Yeah. You have cards here. I think that we can contact you if necessary. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> I did not did not realize there was as many people. Emily did not tell me that. Um, Way to go, but, Emily. But I, I, I can certainly get some more. My son is on my bank account. So does, do I still need uh, a payable thing for finances? Um, you would, uh, so what the um, uh, payable on death for the bank account um, basically what you have done is you have made your account joint. So upon your death, everything in that account goes to your son. And if that's what you want, that's, that's, that's all you have to do. Yes. Good question. Uh, your medical, not medical bills, but like credit cards. I mean like, you know, say I can cook tomorrow and I've got a $3,000 credit card bill. How does that work? Um, so <laughs> that, that's where your financial power of attorney would come into play. So uh, whoever you designate as your decision maker, your agent, um, could <coughs> contact the credit card and then um, tell them that you know, you're taking over, you need to make the payments for that. Um, okay. Most of those companies will want to see, um, for those places, just a copy. How um, long did it take for the death certificate? Say I die today, how long will the death certificate get to my son? I'm, I think I'm confused. If you're just asking about making payments on your no, credit I asked card. Two different, two different okay, okay. Um, Sorry. Yeah, the death certificate is totally dependent upon the funeral home. I would say they normally get those out within a week. Okay. So. Yes. Yeah, we currently have a family trust set up. Yes. But we no longer have the rental properties and the personal property that we have. Is there any need for it that you're... Um, that's a good question. Uh, without actually reviewing your trust, um, I would say if you still have all of your bank accounts and things like that in your trust, then um, yes, you still need that trust. Um, but if you've gotten rid of all your properties, you've sold them and placed that money into your bank account, um, and you do not, you want to protect that from um, Medicaid or anything like that in the future or probate, then yes, all of that would need to stay inside your trust. Okay. We discovered when we moved to Ohio from Indiana, um, you know, we had all the things you mentioned, but we had to do them all over again because the state of Ohio would not recognize anything that was written in another state. So I don't know if anyone here has moved into Ohio they might want to inquire about that. Did everybody hear that? <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of times if you move here from a, another state, um, certain entities will not um, accept your um, POAs or things of that nature from another yeah, state. Everything. Living wills, the, the powers of attorney, none of that would work because they were written from Indiana. But you're, your testamentary will should still be good. It, uh, yes, that was the only one. Okay. okay. You know, we had to do it, redo everything else. Okay. Well, the banks have become a real pain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that is the nicest way I can come up with to say that. Um, so, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I would say <laughs> that you would have to redo that for your financial power of attorney. But I do not understand why the hospital or the nursing homes would not accept your health care or living will. Um, but if that is an issue, then you know you just have to you just have to redo it. If you have a, a life estate for property in another state, it's my understanding that if that is written in the state where the property is, it doesn't matter where you live on your death. 
That is correct. And I do do a lot of um, estates where people are snowbirds. And so you have purchased property in Florida. So what I am now telling a lot of people when they come to do estate planning is if you have property in another state, you need to get to know an attorney there really, really well because your family members will need that attorney upon your passing because that, um, that property has to be probated in that state. Ohio does not reach across the county, the, the lines to go into Florida and deal with that. So, and I am only licensed to practice law in the state of Ohio. So yes, that, that I'm, I'm seeing that all the time now. Okay, if there isn't anything more, then thank you very much. Thank you. Like I said, I thought that was you know, a very important topic to talk about. Um, I have numerous examples of unfortunate incidents and things, and also there's a lot of myths out there. Like a lot of people think that I'm giving up my ability to make my own decisions by signing a health care power of attorney, and that's not true. Usually the very first paragraph stipulates when the health care power of attorney is actually enacted, and you have to be in some sort of incapacitated state or have the inability to make your own decisions. So understand that it is a precautionary thing. You're not giving up your rights. If you were in pathways, is that, is that, I mean, you know, what late to wrong? If you're in pathways, does that give up, you know, you have the, you sign away your rights when you're in pathway? As no, you, you can never sign away your, your rights unless you get a guardian. Right, Janine? Janine, that's pretty much a guardian means right. they take all your, your rights. So, right. no. Pathway, but, but normally residents and pathways have a power of attorney because they don't, you know, they don't their that. impairment is so much yeah. that they're not making rash sound care or financial decisions. That was my question. Thank you. Yep. Um, the, the one thing I will say, though, about a living will, there is a section in the living will where it talks, where it talks about do not resuscitate. I need you to understand that still does not make you a DNR. That is actually a doctor's order. So a lot of times the living will is used if you, if we don't know your code status and the doctor pulls the living will, he sees your last wishes and he will write that order. But you have to have an active signed DNR form by a doctor to actually make it a DNR in a hospital or in in a nursing home. So if you want to be a do not resuscitate, you can have your doctor fill out the form and you keep it. And I know a lot of people keep it in their file of life. Who has a file of life in their bill <laughs> in their apartment? All right. Uh, but that's a good place to keep it. When we were coming here, we were told by the sales office to keep it on the refrigerator so that now, and I had, covered up, nobody sees, just said blah, blah, blah. Well, when the squad gets here, they're not going to read that. <laughs> Well, they're supposed to because we, we let them know it's there. We usually tell them to look on the refrigerator or in the freezer because a lot of people keep it in the freezer because if it's a fire, it won't burn. But yeah, so but we do tell them because they're supposed to. That's where they can get, you know, because what does your file of life contain? Your living will, your DNR, your list of medications, your, your contact information, your physician. That way it just makes things quicker. You know, it, it, it takes away the treasure hunt that they have to do when they know nothing. Um, so you put that things in the file of life, and then that's that's what they're supposed to pull when they come. So now I don't control them. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. File of life. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Oh. I, and I just recently learned that um, you can actually call the local fire department and tell them um, what your code status is, um, and they'll actually have it there and they'll keep it on file, which I thought was pretty interesting. So I did not know that. That is. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Gene. Oh, June. Well, this is a little bit off the subject, but while we're talking about squads, are we primarily served now by the, the fire department in town? I thought years ago we used to get a lot of volunteers, but lately, but you know, I've called them off and <laughs> the fire department. No, it's, it's the fire department is the EMTs. And then, um, you may notice, like, sometimes you'll see a company called Superior. Mm -hmm. 
come to yes. campus. Yeah. So, so, okay, so in the world of medical transportation, it has gone to crap over the last three years. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> uh, most of the places have closed down. Um, no one can get anywhere. Uh, we struggle. You know, if we didn't have three drivers, I don't know how we would survive because trying to set up a transport, whether it's an ambulance or, or non-emergency, or heaven forbid you need a non-emergent stretcher transport, it's, it's very, very hard to accomplish right now because uh, transportation companies are so far and few between. The hospitals had such a hard time getting people out the door, they just went ahead and contracted with the company and just said, you pretty much work for us. So that was superior. So the city of Springfield said, you know, we're so busy running important 911 calls that some of these non-emergent transfers are taking up a lot of our time, so they also contracted with Superior. So like when we call 911, we'll say for somebody, they ask us what the issue is, we tell them. If that person's not actively coding or actively having a stroke or anything like that, they send Superior, you know, if it's like a fall with a suspected break or something like that, it's urgent but it's not emergent, they come and they'll load them up and take them away to save the actual EMTs and that from coming with the with the ambulance. So um, you may get superior show up at your place as well. But yeah, we are pretty much from an EMS, EMT standpoint, 100% served by the city. All right, okay. Now, Mr. Norm, oh. would you like to be next? Sure. We have a couple <laughs> of residents that requested to speak, Norm. Hi, um, I'm Norm Gibson. Um, I've been here a little over a year. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about bank fraud this morning. Uh, what? What? Bank, bank fraud. fraud. Oh, yes. Um, you know, we, we all think we know what we're doing. <laughs> and when it comes to uh, calls we might get as we climb into bed, uh, the bad guys will use early in the morning or late at night to rattle your cage and uh, they're getting very good very good um, they can spin a web that you can fall in the rabbit hole and not realize it it happened to me last uh, the Sunday on the first mm -hmm. I got a call from a fellow and I should have known better but um, since I had just recently gotten a new <coughs> credit card because I had some credit card theft um, and uh, so about a month and a half I'd had this new credit card and so then I got this call and this fellow told me there was some theft in Texas okay um, and then he told me what I knew was on my credit card page the things I had recently charged to my card how much they were, and where where they came, you know, where they went, um, and then he asked me. Then he went through about five of those. How he even saw that, I do not know. And then he told me a few fraudulent ones, and I said, no, no, those weren't mine. That wasn't mine. That wasn't mine. So I'd already bought into the fact that this was the bank. Another problem is my phone. Looking at my phone, it said USAA, okay, it's a military bank. And the number underneath that was the fraud department, which I recognized because I'd been dealing, I'd dealt with it before. So before that late night evening was over, I had given the bank, or this bad guy, some information I didn't even realize I was giving him. A little frustrated, a little concerned, we all do this. So I went to bed thinking, okay, things have been stopped. They have stopped the car, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Woke up the next morning, this is Monday, and I had a message from USAA, um, a text message, and they said that $38,030 was successfully transferred. And I'm thinking, what the is this? So I called USAA, only to find out that my bank account on the checking side had been cleaned out. Um, and the reason I had that amount was because I'd already paid a couple bills. But that was empty. Then they checked the savings account. 
Well, that was empty. And then uh, they switched me to the credit card. And there was an advance cash, a cash advance for $2,500, which, you know, that didn't go to me. Um, and they said that went out to two accounts with my name on it. One was a U.S. bank somewhere, and another one started with an S, and I have no idea what that was. And they said, well, aren't these your accounts? And I said, no. And so I went down this long path of trying to get this squared away. Spent many hours on the phone going through changing passwords, changing, uh, starting a new credit card, or credit card account, starting new bank accounts, and all this, doing all this. Very difficult. Now, yesterday, thankfully, I was made whole again. They gave my money back to me. And today I paid off that $3,100 credit card bill that was. They gave me that in savings because when the bad guys did, they transferred the the cash advance into the uh, savings account and then withdrew it. So I uh, I felt stupid. I felt very violated. And uh, you know, like all of us, see, your blood pressure goes up, your stress level is high, and you're thinking, what am I going to do? Um, I have a, an IT daughter in Portland. She's a supervisor, and I called her, and she said, she went through all the things that I did wrong. She told me, right? She said, you did this wrong, without even asking me if I'd done those. She said, you did this wrong, Dad, 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 and I'm going, I guess I did. <laughs> she said, you know better, and I go, I think I do. She says, okay, and then she went through what I could have done to prevent it. First thing she said is, the banks will never call you. They will send you a text message, or they will send you uh, uh, an email, or a letter. They'll never call you and ask you for anything. They will never ask you for your ID or password. They don't need that to get into your account. They've got other doors they can go in. They, they, don't, they don't want even know response there or something from your bank. She says, the bad guys use cover pages. So it might look like it's from your bank with the phone number and everything. She said, do not click on that page. Go right to your bank phone number, the one that you have in your book or the number that's on your credit card. Dial that number from there. Hang up right away. If somebody calls you to tell you things, thank them and hang up. But never say yes, because they've just got yes on their, on their computer. But just thank them and hang up. Or don't even thank them if you don't want to. Just hang up. And then dial your bank and ask the question, was there something going on? And nowadays, you'll probably find out there wasn't anything going on. It was somebody trying to reel you in. Um, another thing she said to me, she said, Dad, what's our password? And I, well, you know. She said, we did this a couple years ago, what is it? And I go, ugh. <laughs> typical, typical person, okay. She said, and then she gave me a word, and I go, oh, and I gave her the password. She goes, uh, she says, both myself and your other daughter know this password. And if we call you and ask you for some money or to send something to us, ask for the password. And if we don't know that, the computer won't know this, robot won't know that. You can also ask that person something personal they don't only they know. If you don't have it, set up a password, you know, like what did mom used to call me or whatever. Um, the the robots are so good now that they will mimic the voice of your child. You know, this Alexa that we have on people have on on our gadgets. That's recording. So your phones are recording you. Everything's recording your voice all the time. If you've ever sat there and talked a little loud and then your phone goes, the serious, go serious thing, they're going, goes, what'd you say? Well, you know, like, what? You know? It's listening to you all the time. My brother has one of these Alexa on his counter and he says, turn on the lights, turn on the music. And all that time it's recording his voice. And if you say your password's a thing on your thing, then somebody's going to get it. It's got there. <laughs> You know, it, we have to be really careful. I, um, 
I feel bad for me. I feel bad for, you don't know how many people I've talked to. My, my Lodge brothers last Tuesday, I gave them a spiel also. And they, uh, I don't know how many people came up to me afterwards saying, blah, 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 you know, and, and that's a sign of like, um, you just have to be real careful. If you've got an email and it has uh, any way to, ta uh, where they, you know, like they uh, click on here and it'll bring, don't do it. Don't do it. It's, you might be real, it might not be real. Your chances now with the bad guys, are, are getting, they're getting so good, they're better than the banks. And that's what's really sad. The banks are working really hard to get past them and get better. But the banks have a lot of things they're doing. They do have fraud departments that's working really hard. But the crux, that's the only thing they want to do. They want to get you. And they don't care if you're 65, 45, 25, or 90 and it's going to kill you because you just had a, a, a heart attack because of this came through the door. Just um, don't answer the phone. Pardon? <laughs> and if it's important, they'll leave a message or call you back. Uh, and a lot of people do that. They look and see who called. But um, it, it's some, one of those scenarios, and they get you when you're least thinking. And usually, like, I was climbing into bed. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, right there. I'm tired, maybe. But bank's going to call you at that hour. Yeah. <laughs> correct. Correct. Bank. And it's taken me a lot of hours on the bank, changing a lot of passwords, doing a lot of stuff. Another thing I, I found that got me through this is I have Right Pet Credit Union as kind of a, a play account. When I play the pipes, I get paid. I put it in there and so forth. So I had some money in another bank. So when this bank went kapooey, I was able to go to the Right Pet and pay my gas, my electric, and a few my car payment, and a few things like that to get me through until the money came back to me. And oh, I'm glad they did. I mean, I, I don't know about all banks, but mine came back to me. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the bank fraud. If you get a computer, if you're on a computer and the computer says, "Oh, you've had problems," you know, click on this. Mm -hmm. Don't. Or call this phone number and we'll get bring you back. Fraud. Yeah, you've got to be real careful. Thank you. So yeah. anyway, I, think about, I thought about the the bank, but I mean, you don't think about the computer. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah. Well, yeah, you just have to be very careful, folks. I mean, and always go to your original source for the phone I'm old phone. school, right? I'm with pencil. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you also want to set up um, a code word with your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. That's what I just family. mentioned Period. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and if you don't have a code word set up, um, if you get this call, there's something that they know and only they know. That's the question you can ask them, you know. What was the name of that fish you had when you were three? You know, if they could remember the name of the fish. But whatever. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you Norm. If you don't know this about me, I love to watch documentaries, and I'm a sucker for true crime podcasts and all this and that. <laughs> uh, and one of the things, there's a show called um, Trafficked with Mariana Van Zandt, and she just recently did one on fraud. I think it was like the Dominican Republic or Jamaica like that. It's like a whole uh, colony. It's like a whole uh, culture, you know, the scamming culture. They even make music to it and whatnot. And, uh, it's, it's impressive the amount of money they're able to pull off just calling and, and getting you know, people on the phone. But he's absolutely right. The level of intelligence they use from like the artificial intelligent, um, you know, programs. Uh, who in here knows who Bob and Tom are? Anyone listen to Bob and Tom on the radio? All right, thank you, Rodney. <laughs> so Bob and Tom actually did a broadcast. It wasn't them at all. Uh, just like a few months ago, they did like a section of the broadcast. They use artificial intelligence to mimic their voice and broadcast. Like they typed in what they wanted it to say, and people didn't know it wasn't them. Um, it was, it's, it's, it's very impressive, but the whole thing with you know having a loved one call you, um, that's probably the biggest one right now, uh, where they're mimicking a loved one's voice and that. Um, so that's that's one you definitely want to definitely want to watch out for. But, uh, thank you, Norman. That was uh, very informative. Miss Sandy. And Sandy's taking all questions about the entrance gate. Here you go. Oh. <laughs> I'm only, I only want to briefly uh, cover 
You've probably seen flyers around about Sprig and Festival of Reeves. Oh yeah, Sprig for the week. Okay. Sprig is a new auxiliary on campus that stands for Special People Reinvesting in Good. Our purpose or the purpose of Sprig is to do fundraising <coughs> to get monies to put back into the Ohio Masonics communities to be used at all campuses. There is a sprig at uh, Browning, there is a sprig in um, Western Reserve, and I said, we don't have one here? Well, that was a mistake, <laughs> because we do have one here now. Thank you. And, uh, no. <laughs> and our first event is going to be called Festival of Wreaths. It is going to be um, advertised as a community Christmas on the hill. In the, and everybody, anybody, any resident, be it in the villas or in uh, Scottish Rite, any, anybody can participate. We are promoting, they have a sponsorship form that we are going out to neighborhoods and businesses, well, not we specifically, but Bruce Gardner is our head of the sponsorship form, and he has been to many, many places, and others have gone to some. What we do, we ask for persons, can, can you bring one up for me? To see if they want to sponsor a wreath, because at the Festival of Wreaths, we're going to have a wall of wreaths that will be uh, on auction, silent auction. This is one of the wreaths not decorated. A person can sponsor that wreath. There are four different sizes ranging from $25 to $100. Someone can sponsor that wreath, but not necessarily decorate it. Then someone else may prefer to decorate it. We are then going to have a plaque that says sponsored by, decorated by. Can give him a the other one, show them. <laughs> so Joe Schmo sponsored the first wreath and Jack Smith decorated the second wreath. And so all of these are going to be on display. We are also going to be having a craft table and a baking, baked goods table. Anybody, everybody that's crafty, we need you. <laughs> Any craft you can make. I'm about crafted out right now, but I'll keep going. Uh, some people say I can't craft, but I can cook or I can bake. Some people will say, well, I can't craft or bake, but I'll come set up, I'll come tear down, I'll come do whatever is necessary. It is a community event, not a special private club that only certain people can come. The more we have, the more successful this, this will be. We've got a very, very late start. Um, the Festival of Reeds is November 18th and 19th. We're having a breakfast with Santa. Uh, people will, the children will pay, five, the parents will pay five dollars of breakfast with Santa. So I just wanted to let everybody know, and if there's any questions, you can ask me specifically, and I'll answer them as best I can. But if anybody is interested in doing a wreath, uh, you don't necessarily have to buy one of these. You can buy your own, and we will put it on display. It will be, an, again, it's a silent auction. Saturday, it will be open to the public. Someone will be going out and, and reaching out to uh, nearby cities that are here. And we're trying to get the lar a large crowd in so we can get this off the ground. And then hopefully next year it'll be better yet. So, yes? The baked goods and the crafts, will they be for sale? Yes, everything is for sale, everything you make, uh, or bake is voluntary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anything that is sold, all the monies go right back into the foundation. 
Will the wreaths, even though you spend for a wreath and you make a wreath, are they going to be for sale? They are. Everything is for sale. Okay. Yeah, we have to clean it. We're going to stack up the clubhouse and we're going to clean it out. And then we're going to write a check. <laughs> so I'm hopeful that it'll be, that it'll be a success. Um, I just wanted everybody to know that it's not a private thing, that everybody can get involved. If we get a bunch of wreaths that people sponsor and they don't want to decorate them, I'm going to talk, I'm going to knock on doors and say, do you like to decorate a wreath? And I know people do because I've seen them here. <laughs> so yes. I just wanted to let everybody know, and if there's any questions, let me know. We'll see you on the flyers here and there eventually. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, I'm actually very excited about that. That's a very unique event. I think it's going to go really well. I'm so thank you for that. My fingers. <laughs> okay. All right, so she talked about it being a community event, and the more people, the merrier. So that kind of ties into my next guest speaker. Come on, Miss Emily. Hey! <laughs> Hello. Hi. If I haven't met you yet, I'm sorry. Just come up and tap me on the shoulder and tell me your name, and I'll try to remember it. But I'm Emily, fairly new. I've been here before in um, Coffee Connection. But what I'm trying to do is, who all has heard of the Ambassadors? Okay, so um, that has been a group that has kind of been sort of a welcoming committee in the past and present, um, but it's we're kind of trying to revamp that, basically. Um, so I know all the people in Scottish Rite had gotten little cards, little flyers saying, if you'd like to be a part of a welcoming committee, to let me know. And then I hung on the bulletin board right inside the community center for all the villa residents. So what we're trying to do is kind of revamp what the ambassadors did and make it a welcoming committee where we get a group of individuals that would like to be active in this group and they are going to basically, there will be someone in charge of the group and then we will pair them up with a new resident when they move in um, to kind of be their mentor. So, that is basically the gist of it. Maybe invite them to meal with you, introduce yourself when they come in, um, maybe give them your phone number if they have any questions, if they want to re-tour the campus, all of those things, any of those things, invite them to an activity, crafts, you know, pool, whatever. So if anyone is interested, I've had about four or five people respond. Um, if anyone is interested in that, please look me up, give me a call, email me. The posting is on the bulletin board with my email and my phone number. So, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to speak with you. Any questions right now? Yes. What is your title? I am the community relations manager. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Okay. One last guest speaker. I haven't had this many guest speakers in like three years. <laughs> yeah, all day. This is great. All right, Lizzie. All right. Hi, everyone. If you don't know me yet, I think most of you do. Um, I am Liz. I am a board certified music therapist, and I have been here now with the Ohio and Sonic communities for 10 months and I've loved it and I'm so grateful to be a part of this community. Um, so you don't see me here at Springfield every day because I also work at Browning Masonic and Western Reserve Masonic. So I travel around the state every single week to offer music therapy services to our residents in memory care and skilled nursing. So I'm busy, but I have some very exciting news for you all today. Um, our residents in IL and AL. I have been getting more and more questions from, from you all asking, Liz, you know, what, what are you doing for us? When are you going to start meeting with us on a regular basis? And I have been trying so hard to figure out how I can best offer my services to you all. And so last week, I was talking to a couple residents here in our art studio, and we, we got to talking. And they started to talk about how in independent living, one of the most difficult experiences you all might experience 
is watching a really good friend or your spouse develop memory care deficits. You might start to see your spouse physically decline and transition into assisted or skilled nursing or end of life care. And so as I was talking to these residents, they said, we don't have anybody to talk to. We don't have anybody to help us process this information. So I started to, to brainstorm. And what I have come up with is that on a monthly basis, I will offer a quote unquote support group with music therapy based interventions where I will provide a safe space for residents in both independent and assisted living to come together and discuss topics on a regular basis. So for example, death and dying, end of life care, um, love and relationships, healthy coping skills, when maybe you should look for a therapist to help you process difficult experiences. Um, maybe you've got estranged family members that you wish that you could you could connect back with. Um, and maybe there's there's so much that we could process together. So what I am here to to talk to you all about is I know that independent and assisted living sometimes like to do things on their own. Um, so I am working with Stacy Walters here in Life Enrichment to get some dates on the calendar for an introductory, introductory meeting so that whoever is interested can come to the first meeting, we can share our thoughts, you can ask as many questions as you <coughs> like, and then we will have it on the schedule regularly as long as it's something that everyone's interested in. And it's not something that you would always, you don't have to come to every single meeting. Um, it'll be on the K-4 schedule, so you know as that's approaching, you can see the theme that we'd be addressing that week or that month, and then you can make the decision of whether or not you would like to attend that meeting. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any and all of them. And once we have some dates, they will be on K-4, and I will make sure that Stacy and myself can, can get that to everybody as soon as we have those available. Any questions? Okay, thank you all so much. All right, we got three minutes left, and Stan takes 45 seconds to give a benediction, so. <laughs> I can make it fast. <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, that was really great. I think today was very arm. informative. What's that? You said you haven't talked about the wonderful arm that's working. It is working, thank you, see? Is this still copy connection? Yeah. <laughs> I have one little request. What's that? Well, at lunch, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd like to have a cup of soup and maybe a sandwich. And it's not on the menu. But I've been asking for it, and others have been asking for it, and they get the cup of soup. But I don't want to pay for a bowl of soup. So could you please put that on the menu? <laughs> You have, to go to <laughs> you have to go to the menu chat and tell the oh, Yeah. No. Yeah, that's what we do. I thought he could do anything. He so, can. So we want to offer a cup of soup instead of a bowl. Okay. Yes. Or, yes. Well, or whip. Some people a like a bowl. A cup of soup is the measurement of a bowl. This well, is they have the <laughs> <They have that. laughs> All right, that has put me over the edge. Okay. <laughs> right. Natasha said it's a certain number of ounces, regardless of what container it's put into. That has been brought up in chat, at menu chat. Thank you. It's so that. many ounces, regardless of the container. Yeah, because it's just a scoop. Yeah. The ladle is like eight, eight yeah, ounces. Yeah, yeah. But if you're real <laughs> friendly to the servers, your scoop might overflow <laughs> into the bowl. <laughs> Unfortunately, asking for less food is not something I'm accustomed to, so I don't, I'll figure that part out for you. I'd like oh. you to get rid of the ants. You may have Same. noticed a few Buckeye fans here. We'll be, we'll be on uh, Peacock in the dining in the clubhouse tomorrow. It will be, or are you asking Will it be? <laughs> so that if we're on Spectrum, you can get the Peacock, which is the only way to get Ohio State Purdue tomorrow at noon. Dave's not here, so you have to see yeah, it's it's I don't know that one. So I have to watch it on Peacock? It's not on regular TV? Right, right. It's right. exclusive. Yeah. You have to put it on the big screen. Yeah, you have to Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's un-American in Ohio State. Look. Oh, jeez. 
the NFL set that precedent with the NFL network a couple years ago. So I'll try to figure that out. Um, I'll see, because like I don't have a Peacock account. I don't know, but if we, you said if we have Spectrum, you get it? have Spectrum, they offer it. Okay, let me, I'll do some research and see what I can find out. I, I, a, I didn't know that, which I would have been highly upset tomorrow. Um, but I'll, I'll see, I'll see what we can do. I'll talk to John Willie, he probably uh, knows more about that stuff than I do. But we'll figure it out. Has, has Disney, has Dis is it true that Disney has removed some of Yes. The, okay, some of those channels, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, nothing. Well, because two residents, not me, two residents said they pay per month that include um, cable. I think you know, me too. Yeah. yeah they, there's, there's an ant pile here. Well, I killed most of them, and the rest ended up on my cookie. And they're crawling everywhere. They're all over. <laughs> At any rate. <laughs> For a second, I thought we were going to need that support group sooner. Yeah, but yeah. There are actual ants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, a couple of residents have said that since our and it's not me, since our monthly rent pays to include cable, and we're not getting the channels that we used to, and that somehow Spectrum's getting money back to Masonic, why are we not reaping that fifteen dollars? Well, I don't get no money back for. I don't either, but I, no way. So how are we going to get? So I, I have Directv at home, and I lost my local channel for like six months. They didn't give me a deal. They don't. They don't reimburse us for anything, and, and they control the channel lineups a hundred percent. I mean, they they kind of fluctuate, you know, all the time. It is bad about Disney. I mean, they yeah, I, I know a lot of things are going on. Like I said, with Directv, I lost um, channel two. I, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, Channel Two News. Yeah. I lost that for like six months because they fell out of contract and <laughs> Viacom or whatever it is was holding them hostage, and it was it was crazy. But yeah, we don't have any control over it. I can ask Spectrum, but yeah, I want we don't Central. control the the line the lineup. But I know Disney yeah, and um, some of the others made some major changes, um, and a lot of them now. You know, content's more going online, like with Peacock and things like that, and um, more money. yeah, and it's it's yeah. all just they're they're trying to force everyone to go to streaming and and different things like that. But I didn't know the channel lineup changed. They didn't give us any heads up. Uh, but oh. I can tell you, they also didn't lower our bill uh, <laughs> by any stretch. And check so, on that because they cut out some of the channels. Yeah, all right. They <laughs> what they did was is when this first started. And they took the football off and all. Bruce, isn't what they did, wasn't it that they offered fifteen dollars back yep. to you? Yep. That's before what they, they settled this. That's Not to us. No. That's where the fifteen dollars I think come in. Of course you're, you're Well you have to like account. ask for it. You're yes, you're a large account, so well I don't know how you work, but an individual person in an individual house. You know, you could ask they, for fifteen. They could ask for fifteen dollars. Yeah. Well, they settled this, uh, and well, then they settled it. Of course, all of you people that watch the football games got your football games back. That's all that's important. But I there you go. <laughs> and that's my husband's <laughs> people. Okay. Well, we lost like one forty-one, which uh -huh. is Doctor Paul, uh -huh. and you know the Zoo, Central, Smithsonian, and FX. F yeah, we lost it all. And all, and we are not getting them back. Right. So you have to. So go all of Spectrum, like no. they, even like community, they, Disney, all, anything that Disney owned, yeah. anything that Disney owned. Oh yeah, and and Disney owns a lot. A lot. And and it's more money. Money. Okay. But what they did was, is they settled it, of course, right before the game of the first of the season. <coughs> Everybody got their football games back, but in other words, what they did was they negotiated, and the football games obviously are the big thing. And, uh, and the little people who liked the little stations, they lost their butts in it. 
So we want you to negotiate for us. I don't have spectrum, so I don't know that. So this wow. Is what we can do. Yeah, all of us. Yeah. It's it's yeah. That What's that? He's I can ask. Yeah, we can find out. I have a contact there. I just don't know what he's going to tell me. Tony, they took the Disney channels off for a period of time while they were negotiating, and they're back on. No, no, they are not. Some of them are. Yeah, not. Not. Most of them are back. FX is yeah. back. Some of them are not. ESPN back. Some are not. Yeah, the football. But you can go well. to a certain, just like streaming, buy that station yep. and get it back. Yep. Yeah, they That's tried. Your choice. Like I said, when they took away Channel 2 from us on DirecTV, um, I had they had the ability to go use, I think Channel 2 uses Peacock, actually. And when I went to go do it, they said, well, tell us who your provider is. As soon as I put in DirecTV, they said, oh, you can't get it. I was like, oh. so they told me to go do something. Then I went there, and because that's my service, then I couldn't I couldn't use the app unless I paid eleven dollars a month, which I wasn't going to do. Is Spectrum the only game in town? Yes. Yep. Local competition here. No, C cable is monopoly. Yeah, cable is a monopoly. Like where you know where I'm from in Youngstown, it's Armstrong. Then I come down here, and it's Spectrum. It's like a you know one wire system everywhere. So depending on your geographical area, if you want to get away from it, then you have to go to either dish, you have to go to streaming, but you, you can't use like a cable because it's all you know via the one the one wire. But, and I, I did not I was not aware of the channels. Excuse me. So I will I will reach out to John Snizek and uh, try to see if I can get well, at least you, some information about it. You were dealing with the gate. We didn't want to cause any more stress. <laughs> well, I'm more worried about cable now. We should probably. <laughs> we were worried too. We all, yeah. Benita? Um, just to add to, we've been doing this little problem up there. Uh, there are now ants in the bathroom. Oh, they're everywhere. <laughs> they're all, my whole, they're biting. Yeah, it's getting they cold bite. outside. Okay. I'll get, I'll get, um, a one to come out. And also, I was wondering if you could put some bleachers down by the pathway driveway so people can sit down there and watch the gates working. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess we have to talk about the gates. First, there's Watergate, now we have Gate Gauge. So, and how upset the staff is getting waiting on. Uh, them to get through and how three or four cars are sneaking through yep. yeah. all the time. Alright, so we're going to talk about the saga of the gate. So we started with the exit gate, we got three hours in, someone broke it. We repaired it, which actually made it a little quicker because it got lighter. So the exit gate works just fine. You just have to be patient. So if you actually stop at the stop sign and know you have to stop again, if you don't hit 30 miles an hour between the stop sign and the gate, you shouldn't hit it. You can tailgate out. In other words, how the, how the gates are set is they have a timer. So when you trigger the gate, it starts that timer. Then we have loops in the ground, which will either reset the timer or tell the timer, you don't need to run because we're going to go ahead and close. So we had a contractor who built this thing a long, long time ago. Once upon a time, we started this gate project and things were going a certain way. We have since let go of that contractor for various reasons. Um, this is just another one. What we were not seeing when we first started the entrance gate was that it was working properly. It was not working as it was designed and laid out. So we had to call the gate company. So the gate company was able to come out here on Wednesday and we learned a lot on Wednesday. So prior, the gate company only worked with the contractor because that's who was paying the bill. <coughs> when they came out and they met with us, they immediately understood what we were trying to do and they immediately made changes. First change is the timer. It was set to four seconds. So if you pulled up to the gate and the gate went open and, like, and you just waited a, a couple seconds to go, it would start to shut. And then the loops weren't put on the reverse cycle. So what does that mean? It means if you're still on that loop, the gate will bounce up. It was actually set on the close cycle, which meant, didn't matter if you were on the loop or not, at that time or time, it dropped. Which is why when transportation went through, it dropped and they snapped it off. Because 
it was not programmed correctly. It was not programmed to how we had it designed to run. They programmed it how the contractor told them to program it. I have no idea why. I have no idea what they thought was going to happen, but we know what ended up happening. So as of Wednesday, we have it all reprogrammed. And I'm, and I'm going to tell you, we had to program it differently than how it's intended to work. So you can't tailgate going out because we don't want to hold people coming out. If you were on the campus, you were meant to be here. If you want to leave, we're not holding you prisoner. If you tailgate somebody, it'll bounce back up and you can go through. The entrance gates, there's even a sign that says, let's one car at a time and the gate closes. That has turned out to be troublesome because people don't slow down coming off that road going to the gate. So what we've learned <laughs> is wait. that they come in at 50 miles an hour, they gain speed between the road and the gate, and if that <laughs> gate is up, they're going to try to make it. <laughs> so we programmed it to cause less issues. So you can actually tailgate coming in. I don't want you to make it a habit because that is going to change. We're just trying to kind of do it in steps so that we can save money on gates because I'm already out of gates and I gotta, I gotta make some more. So we're working on it. I'm gonna make a gate video and make, put music to it. So we are making a gate video. I actually took some pictures today. I was gonna try to put a PowerPoint together to show. So here's what I've learned. A. Oh, there's my mask. If you have this badge and your gate pass on the same thing, it's not gonna work. This is on a different frequency than the gate pass, which is why we have to have two. If they are together, like some of my employees wear them on a lanyard. And so like some of my employees don't drive or have six cars and drive a different one every day or something like that. So they take and they put their gate pass on the back of it. If you have them together, you're not getting in. One cancels the other, you won't get in. They have to be separated. So that's the first thing we learned is some cars, usually what we're understanding are Subarus, and I think they said Nissans, um, put some sort of coating on their windshields. It's like an anti-glare or something like that coating and actually blocks that signal. So you may have to move it down in your windshield. So if you hold it up and it's not letting you in, go closer to your dash because they do it on like the top section where, you know, like when you look at your windshield, it's like, um, for, uh, not frosted, yeah, but glare. tinted up there. Yeah. That upper screen, they kind of bring that down for an anti-glare thing, and it's actually stopping that signal from going out. So on some vehicles, if you're holding it up and it's not going, just hold it closer to your dash and see if that works. So that's another <laughs> thing. We also um, have, we're, we're having more signs made because uh, somebody told us they wanted us to make sure we had a guard check there, even though it was never planned to be manned. Someone. I can't say, but <laughs> I will tell you that what that has caused is people stop at the window, not the push button. So we're going, we're having some signs made that tell people push for entrance or something like that because it's holding traffic up because they're sitting there thinking someone's going to come to the window. Yeah. Now the other thing I will say is 99% of the employee issues that you that that Danita was pointing out are uh, just flat out user error. So I have a cool little program on my phone called Vercata. So at 5.45 this morning when I started getting text messages that this gate's messed up and blah, 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 I turned the cameras on. And I sat there and watched as a staff member try to get in with her badge. <laughs> well, you're not getting in. Thanks for holding up traffic. <laughs> get back in your car. Uh, let's see, what else did I have? Uh, today, I manned the push button uh, for a little bit because Scotty wanted some breakfast. So I thought it would be fun to sit there. That was a treat. Um, <laughs> I had a staff member park at the access gate side. It wouldn't go up. So she went over and pushed the button and said, it's not going up. I said, do you have your gate pass? No. Well, it's not a retinal scanner. It's not a, D, you know, a, a DNA scanner. It takes a gate pass. If you don't have your pass, you ain't getting in. 
So I said, well, you're going to have to back up. Well, by this time, she had three cars behind her. <laughs> so I had to open the gate, and then everyone else just spilled and went around, and then I had to open it again because she got stuck. <laughs> but a lot of it is user, is user error. Um, we had to make some adjustments in the programming as well because we learned a little bit about visitors. <laughs> visitors have also a tendency that when they push the button, they put the car in park. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what does that do? It causes a delay in the reaction to start hitting the gas, and I already told you it was on a timer. So we learned we had to increase the timer because as they were putting it in park or whatever they were doing before they went, it was allowing the gate to start to come back down. We don't know how to make those adjustments until Wednesday when the company came out and, and walked through it all. Now we are like gate experts, <laughs> and we know how to program it, and we can adjust it. So we've been fine tuning it. Right now, the easy pass gate, the resident and employee gate, you can tailgate. Now I don't want you to try it because we're trying to change it, but we did that because I have to try to get, it's like, it's like one step at a time. And it, it, it will eventually start to, to lessen, but we also put it on the reverse loop. So there's a, uh, a loop on the ground cut into the pavement when you, what we learned is that access pass reader is very strong. I can set that thing off with my pass from 50 feet away. Now, we have seen some people like do everything right and it not catch it. I can't explain it, we just give them new passes and then they work and it's just fine. <coughs> we, we have videos of it, some of them are funny, but um, when they drive <laughs> in, if they activate the gate from too far away, it was timing out before they got there. So we had to make some adjustments, but we also put it so that if they did time out before they got there, when they hit that loop, it reset the timer. That's what's called, the, that's the reverse loop. So we've made a lot of adjustments. I know a lot of it's like kind of technical, but as it works right now, if you do it properly, it's gonna work 100% of the time. I have cycled that thing myself probably a thousand times and it works every time when you do it right. If you're behind somebody who can't get in, they're probably not doing something right, holding up the wrong card or, or something. We've also have, you know, even though there's a sign, it's painted on the ground, people still confuse the lanes. So we're having um, stickers made that say, access pass only, and it'll be on the arm of the gate so that at least it's something in front of you instead of like on the pavement. Not everybody reads the words on the pavement. Right. And that sign that's out there, some people may not see it you know, so far back, so we're, we're gonna put it right on the gate, access pass only. And on this one, it's gonna say like visitor lane or something like that. And then on the exit one, it's gonna say not in entrance because people still try to go in through the exit. Um, so we're gonna have those put right on the gates to kind of help. And we're having some extra signage made just to make it a little easier. It's, it's things that um, you, you, we learned from human behavior by watching the videos or talking to people. So we're trying to put things in place. Some of it, I'm not gonna lie, I feel like we probably, like I had a, I had a gate company. They are literally called Automatic Gates Plus. Do you, know, you wanna know what they do? Gates, it's the only thing they do. There was some tips they probably could have given us a long time ago to make this a lot easier, but they didn't. Last night, instead of this car, this car came in and stopped. Nothing happened. So that car, instead of going north and south, ended up east and west right in the traffic and here comes another car in right behind it uh, there's going to be an accident there I, I i have no doubt something's going to happen i i actually chased um while manning the button one day uh i let a visitor in and somebody was coming in the right lane even though they had an access pass and that gate was going to open, they decided to jerk the wheel and literally I could hear them squeal the tires oh my God. as they whipped into the left lane. That's so, that's good. Yeah, so I uh, paid, them a little, <laughs> paid them a little visit. I think it's advisable if when we're coming in the entrance section that we leave some space between each cars because 
most of the time our encounters are that people are going to back up when they have a problem. Yeah. And if you've got three behind you, you can't. Well, one of the signs that we're considering is... Do not back up. It, well, do not back up and then posting the security phone number. I don't really want to make the security phone number public, but I would rather somebody make a phone call than... Because, I mean, if I post it up there, everyone's going to know what it is. And I don't, I don't really want that, but... We're, yes, especially in the in the mornings and at night, we're talking about having security at least down there to help. Like to that clock, you know, they're gonna get yeah, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I learned a lot this morning on that button. First off, if you ever see Scotty or Janice, everyone know who Scotty and Janice are? No. So Scotty, Scott. former security guard, worked in grounds, now he works in my PBX. Janice is a 30 plus year nurse at SMC. She now works at PBX at night. If you think answering that phone is easy, put the gate button next to it. I think they should be allowed to drink on the job, honestly, because it is crazy. I wanted to compliment on Janet, because the gate was not, I got out without any problem, and I wanted to you see, like I had to stop before I got in. So I called and I said, yes, is the gate's working? Do I stop? She goes, no, they're not drive through. And I want to thank her because it's, yeah, it sounds stupid, but I mean, the gates, I don't know whether they were working or not. I didn't work if my car crashed. Nope, you're all right. I paid, I paid for the thing. <laughs> really simple. It doesn't work for me this morning. It comes back here. I got a new car. I got a nice backup. I got a new car. 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 And I had difficulty reaching that damn book. I was in a head much fell on it. It should be lower and further over. So the, it, it, there's actually a uh, right. So he said that he's having he had trouble reaching the um, push button. So when we were actually designing this, the architect who designed it, there are actual regulations to where those things are placed. So they can't be sticking out past the curb. So when you look at it, it's like pretty much right in line with the curb. So there, it's out as far as it can go. And then there are two. There's one at what car height is. Now, car height and truck height, that's what we have. There's two buttons. When we say truck, it's not pickup truck. It's semi-truck delivery truck. Car height is not easy for people in an actual car because it's higher. Because yeah. it's, it's at a height that accommodates SUVs and uh, like sedans. So it's kind of like on the higher side. So if you're in an SUV or a pickup truck, you may have to reach down. And if you're in a car, you got to you got to reach up. Would it be just as easy to put somebody in the shack? <laughs> Not as cheap. Not using <laughs> and forget the rest of it. Not as cheap. You got this shack and you're not using. I'm going to outsource the gate next, actually. <laughs> we followed someone through yesterday, or I did. And they they were straddling the lanes. Yes. Yep. They were staying in the right lane. They were somebody from the community. Yeah. So that that is another issue. Some people pull up in the middle. Yeah. Now we can't put a barrier between because then it would um, cause a problem for semi trucks that come in, and we do get a lot of semi trucks that deliver. That's why we don't have a center barrier. But yeah, I, I've actually seen that n numerous times on film. Uh, Johnny, I'm just curious. I, it may not be appropriate, but the if you are filming some of the snafus all of them um, it might be inter, uh, educational and entertainment to put that on the k4 so that any tenant could look at some of those events i was going to make a k4 movie put it, put it to music so it, it um or you can have the booth the, the, the guard shack has i think seven different cameras there one two three four five eight different cameras we see coming in, coming out, and four different angles, and then there are two cameras per lane reading license plates. <laughs> so we have a log of every license plate that comes into into the campus, uh, which is kind of neat because Bricada has um, there's some cool things about our camera system. It has facial recognition. Why is that important for us? Well, if you've lived here more than a couple years, you know that we've had some missing residents. 
<laughs> and Bricotta helped me at least know that, that that resident had left the campus because I was able to track her. Um, we have a dementia unit. I have people with dementia who are not on a dementia unit. People who grow into dementia and they wander and then we have to try to track them. Facial recognition is great. The other thing it can do is with these license plate readers, I can track that car. So let's say I have a situation, you all know we had to barricade the campus because we were worried about someone coming on due to a domestic dispute. I could click that, I could type in a, a, a number. Like if I know that person's uh, license plate number, I can put it in a system and the system will alert me every time that license plate shows up on the camera. I can also track that car anywhere I have a camera on campus. So it's, it's actually really cool. The other thing I can do is I can pull it up and I can say, show me every white pickup truck. Boom, that screen full fills with every white pickup truck. It, it's 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 pretty powerful, and it's used <laughs> only for you know it's used honestly for the safety and security of awesome. when something goes wrong. How's my easiest way to find it when the campus is this big? Um, and that that's what we've had to use it for is either a, a life saving measure where we're trying to find somebody. Um, actually, I'll tell you one where it really helped is we had a missing resident who wasn't missing. We just thought they were. They went on a bus trip, but they didn't sign up, so we didn't have it on a log. <laughs> I went to Vercata, I put him in, went down, selected the resident, hit click, and what did I see? I see him walk on the bus. Well, he wasn't on the law, he didn't sign up, but there was a seat, so we went. But he didn't tell anybody, and it was in assisted living, and, and it you know, caused, we, when we have a missing resident, we drop everything we're doing to start. And it, it really helped to have that system. But yeah, the license plates, um, you know, a couple, I think I told you guys once before, we had the police call us and told us there was a stolen vehicle on our property. And they said, the license plate is Fast Kitty. Well, if I had that system up and running then, we would have known he never came onto the campus. So. Can you not give, like, not tickets, but notices to, hey, you know, this is your third infraction, whatever, whatever? We, we can. They're not enforceable by law. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, right. like I have my best, uh, my best friend, he's 47 years old. He can never be a Kent State student ever because he got so many parking tickets when I was a student at Kent State. <laughs> he can never enroll. I mean, that'd be the best I could do. Mm. You know, I can't enforce, like, a parking oh. ticket or anything. I, speeding. I yeah, applaud the, you yes, for yes. supporting yes. this. Oh, oh, thank you. And FYI, if anybody breaks a gate, their insurance company will pay for it. Well, <laughs> factual, I hope so. Factual, I usually have <laughs> that job. Because it's uh, we we've gone through a few. We burned through all our spares right now. So. <laughs> we knew it. You know, Tony, uh, it might. If as much as the gates cost and as many as they get broke, it still might be worth paying a, a guard in a shack uh, outside the benefit. I mean, I, I know they get health benefits. Rodney would like to get paid. Yeah, I'm taking yeah. volunteers, Rodney. If you want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> or you break a gate, you buy the new one. When when um, a guest pushes the button, does somebody answer and ask them questions? Okay, we can talk about that. It's a good question. So. There's base stations. The first and main base station sits right on the PBX desk. So they're, they're my first line of defense. The second line of defense is it also has its own app that goes to the cell phone of security. So at night, when PBX leaves at 10 o'clock on, those all go directly to security. Same with the push buttons at the front of the buildings. Those all go to security. We don't get many people that come from 10 a.m. to like, 5.30. 5.30 is usually when we start to see employees roll in. That, that time frame, there's not a lot. So it, that's okay. As a backup, there's another base station put on the Rickley Commons nurses station. It is what we call a rollover. So if it goes unanswered or <coughs> there's on a downtime, it'll, that's the only time it'll roll over to there. So if it goes to PBX and goes to security, they don't answer in a certain amount of time, it rolls over to the nurses station. Um, so it, you do get a person you, who answers. We do ask what they're here for, um, and you know, as long as they're giving us a resident name, we're, we haven't really declined anybody. Um, we've even had to let people in because you know our main gate happens to be the, or our main drive happens to be the entrance to 68. We get so many people who pull up to there because they thought it was the exit, and they and now they're stuck. We just open it, we tell them, and we can watch them. We tell them we're going to let you in, turn around, go right back out the exit, and then turn right. Because they turn in thinking it's on the exit and then they pull into our campus. We actually, until we had a guard check, didn't know how often that happened, but it happens a lot. It happens a lot. 
All right, we'll stand. You ready to send us on our way? Oh, no, let's go for another half hour. <laughs> Do we have a pool going on the date for the first person that runs down one of those right. dates and breaks it? So I'm not going to lie. I had an over-under that it was going to be an employee coming in the wrong direction was going to break the exit gate first. That was my guess. <laughs> I actually had $10 on what employee it was going to be, and I, I, I did not win. Who won? I, actually, I don't know who won. It wasn't me. Hopefully, at some point, you can get back to doing your regular job and not have to be the gatekeeper every day, all day long. Tech in the universe, we come to you with, with uh, happy hearts and thank you for the blessings you've bestowed. We greatly appreciate the fact that with your grace, Tony has kept his sanity and hope that continues. We ask that you be with the family of Tony's uh, uh, that passed away and comfort them as best you can. We thank you for the good food that we have. We thank you for your watching over and direction for all the first responders and the military that protect us. We ask your blessing and continued guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm sorry, I, I did forget one thing. Um, I, uh, we are currently experiencing a COVID outbreak in Rickley Commons. So please, uh, third floor. So please, if you're going to go to Rickley, um, if you don't need to go there, don't go there. And if you do, please wear a mask. And also, this one all started because visitors came to visit a resident who were sick. So if you are not feeling well and you're having signs and symptoms, remember, there's still way more things than COVID. RSV is on the rise right now and influenza is on the rise. So if you're not feeling well, please oh and call too. Yeah, please uh, just restrict your visitations. All right. Thank you, everybody.